Okay, so John chapter 5, uh, verse 41 is where we are. Um, we left off, obviously, with the previous verses before verse 41, uh, talking about them, the Pharisees, and them searching the scriptures because they thought just their study of the scriptures gave them eternal life, and yet they could not see Christ, who was a manifestation of those scriptures right in front of them. You know, they couldn't see the forest for the trees, basically. They had a, a knowledge of the Bible, but they didn't really act that way. And we talked about how we see plenty of people like that today. They have a great knowledge of the Bible, yet they don't put it into practice in, in one way or another. It could be the way they act. It could be the language that they use. It could be the way that they treat other people uh, and what have you. So he was talking about that, the fourth witness there. Uh, Jesus called was the scriptures, the foundation of his opponent's tradition. We remember that he would get on to them and he would say, in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrine, the commandments of men. And that the Pharisees, when uh, his disciples were with him, and remember they weren't washing their hands, they would ask, why do your disciples not follow what? The traditions of... Uh, of the elders. It was an actual doctrine. There was nothing in the law necessarily about that. But, you know, the, a good portion of the rabbi's work was to diligently study the scriptures. That was a major focus, uh, the study of the Torah. It was regarded to them as the dearest part of life. And if you remember from past discussions, I, I know that the class has kind of been broken up because of the pandemic and Sunday mornings and what have you, is that when the, the Jews looked at the whole of life, it wasn't just how a person acted. It was who they were. It was the essence of their being, right? Uh, to kind of clarify, and, and I used this example before, if someone were to say to me, if they were to ask, well, who are you? Well, I'm Mike Lane. Okay, that's not who you are, that's your name. Who are you? Well, I'm a preacher. No, that's what you do for a living. Who are you? Okay, well, I, I'm a husband, I'm a father. No, that's your status within the family. Who are you? So it really kind of drills down and gets rid of all of the the titles, the rank, and what have you. And for the Jews, it is, this is the essence of a person, right? And so Christ, in calling this witness the scriptures, their chief work in studying them, and it being the dearest part, he says, look, you're looking at the scriptures and you're studying them so much and you think in the scriptures you have eternal life. But the scriptures, they testify about me. I'm the one who gives eternal life. And of course, we know from other passages, he would say that I am the bread of life, or when he's talking to the woman at Jacob's well in John chapter 4, he talks about the everlasting water and what have you. And so we, we come into verse 41 and verse 42. He says, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Now these leaders, they had another problem. And that was the lack of love in their hearts. He says, you do not have the love of God in you. Now really what he's referring to, it, meaning the experience of God's love for them, uh, as well as their expression of a love for God. They claim to love God, but their attitude toward, to, toward Christ and other people proved that it was counterfeit. Uh, remember that they were more interested in, you know, the popularity and how many people they had following them and getting more people into, you know, getting more money into the treasury and that was their focus. And we know that when we focus on these earthly things and we're not showing a love for God, if that's our primary goal, then we're displaying that we don't have a love for God because God is, is against that. You know, anytime we look at devotion to God in Scripture or suffering as a Christian, it's, or prosperity with God, it's never physical things. There is nowhere in the New Testament that physical prosperity is related to devotion to God. It's all spiritual. 
But them just being related uh, or looking at the physical. He knows that they don't have a love for God. Their attitude towards God's word hindered their faith. But, but so did their attitude towards themselves, towards other people. You know, if they were so diligent in studying the scriptures, in looking for the Messiah, then they would have seen the Messiah right in front of them. Because they, we already talked before about how they couldn't, um, that they couldn't deny the works uh, that he did. The Pharisees, they enjoyed being honored by men. They didn't seek the honor that comes from, from God alone. They didn't honor the Son because, why? If for them it's a reciprocal relationship, the reason that they didn't honor Christ is because Christ didn't honor them. He wasn't the only one that Christ paid honor to. Now, there's a difference between honor and respect. There's a difference between honor and obedience. But the only one that Christ gave honor to was God. He was obedient to the law. He was a, a righteous Jew who came to fulfill the law. Right? And so they, they don't honor him. Let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, does someone mind reading verses 1 through 12? <laughs> Don't everybody jump at once. Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Okay. Phylacteries. Some. Phylacteries. And lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. And respectful greetings in marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that very much. So, in looking at Matthew 23, it's very descriptive of the reason here as to why, why Christ isn't honoring these men. You know, it is that he's not honoring them because they're not honoring God. Because it says, you know, that they put burdens on people, but they're not willing to, to handle those burdens themselves. They do everything to be seen by other people. You know, they love this place of honor at the feasts and all of this. They love being recognized for who they are. And, and you know, Jesus, he's already said in verse 34 of John 5, you know, I don't accept human testimony. And now he adds that he doesn't accept human glory either. Pray, praise from men. The works that he does, including the signs, testify to who he is. And in so doing, they manifest his glory. You know, people are fleeting, right? The opinions of people are fleeting. They go with uh, popularity. What's, you know, what's happening in culture today? And, you know, the tide turns, right? And so if any of us, for example, were to base our worth on the opinions of others, then what happens when the opinions of those others change? 
Not a trick question. If we place our value in the opinions of other people instead of in God, and the opinions of those other people toward us change, then what does that say about our value? Our value changes with it. You know, it's just like the stock market. Depending on the value, it goes up or it goes down, depending on what someone else is doing. But God, he's the one constant. And so Christ, he's saying, look, I, I'm not accepting human praise. I'm not looking for human glory. Because what you people do one minute, you won't do the next minute. Just look, for example, in the time of the judges. We read about the book of Judges, and one of the constant themes is they did that which was right in their own eyes. The people were faithful to God, then they transgressed the law, they were punished, they repented, God forgave them. The people were faithful for a little bit, then they transgressed the law, they were punished, and it just goes into this cycle. So the one constant, though, though is God. And if he stooped to becoming the kind of Messiah that they wanted that they were looking for, then there's no doubt that he would have attracted their praise if he had become the one that they wanted. Jesus was very much, for someone who established the church, very much anti-establishment. Now, when I say anti-establishment, I'm not talking he was against government or, or anything like that. You know, Paul told uh, us that we're to pray for our leaders you know, Jesus said that, uh, you know, our th the authorities that are there, you, you're only there because God wants you there. But it, it's, it's in the sense that his entire commitment was to God, not to the establishments of men, not to what men had built up for themselves. And it's something that goes all the way back to the beginning with the Tower of Babel, or Babel, depending on, you know, tomato, tomato when the people, instead of journeying like God said, they settled in a plane, said, let us build this tower to heaven. And it even says, so that we may do what? Does anybody remember? So that we may see God. Some translations say, so that we may make a name for ourselves. And God said what? Modern day translation, it's not about you. Smacks them down, scatters them, and, and scatters all, all of the languages. God has been a, against man trying to establish things for himself since, since the beginning. But if Christ had, had bowed down to them and did what they wanted, there's no doubt that he would have gotten their praise. But he wasn't interested uh, in that. He wanted to receive honor, the only honor that God... Uh, the, the type of honor that only God could give. You know, verse 23, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus came from God. He, he was the, the agent of God in the flesh. You know, John 1 and verse 14, right? And the Word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. And he would experience the glory of returning to God. But Jesus was not like the self-serving opponents who use their righteous positions to, to gain the praise of, of other people. Now, what's that say about us? Now, that's a characteristic of a Pharisee. So what does that say about us if we are simply seeking to gain the favor of other people? We have some of the traits of it, of one, sure. And that's something that, you know... It can be a good thing to be associated with, depending on, on what part, if you're talking maybe adherence to the law, but on the other hand, it can't be because they were ones who added to the law and they took away from it and, and created their own traditions. For Jesus, uh, human praise at this stage, it, it was little of no account because he, he knew, again, the fickle nature of humanity. If we were to just go back to chapter 2, Chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. 
So he didn't, ex he didn't seek it out, and he didn't expect human affirmation uh, for what he was doing. His perspective was the affirmation that, that is the glory uh, of God, which is where our focus should be. Uh, any thoughts or, or comments so far? Okay. Um, yeah, really, Jesus, he, he, he pinpoints this, this basic flaw in his opponents that, that prevented them from, from hearing the witnesses. I don't, I don't accept praise from men, but I know who you are. You know, you don't have to open your mouth, and I know who you are. The call search the scriptures, it, it still dominates really what, what Jesus now adds. First, on the real moral or, or spiritual reason for the unbelief of these Jews, which we see in verses 41 through 44, and we're kind of making our, our way through there. And then also the consequences of that belief, which we find coming up in the last three verses, verses 45 through 47. So verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. In my Father's name, the very fact that he has come in the name of his Father, that he, that he has predicated nothing about himself. I'm not coming in my own name. I, I'm coming in the name of God. That he has executed the mission of the Father, done the works of the Father. Answered to the testimony of the Father in the Old Testament, that he has even avoided the often falsified name of Messiah. Because there were other people who were claiming to be the Messiah. Jesus was not the only one. And some of these were accepted in the synagogue because they were just like the rabbis. They were in it for themselves. Or maybe they showed political clout or maneuvering, or maybe they had a tactical mind. Because remember from Acts chapter 1, when they're asking, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel, they were looking for a military and a political leader, not a spiritual one. They thought Israel was going to break the shackles of Rome and free them, just like God had done back in the days of, in the days of Pharaoh. And... But Jesus, he is even avoided, he's avoided that. And so that's one of the reasons why they didn't receive him. I mean, I mean, it's multiple reasons. He didn't seek their praise. He didn't seek their glory. He didn't seek their affirmation. He didn't seek for them to testify about him. He, he wasn't trying to make a name for himself. He wasn't trying to run for a political office. He wasn't trying to take over any military tribunal or, or any type of military unit. He simply came to seek and to save the lost. That was it. That, that was his whole purpose. And, and really, the Old Testament prophets, you know, they speak to us in, in the same way. You know, Micah 6 and verse 8 is one of my favorite verses. And it lays it out really clearly, and it's something that I try to work on, and sometimes I absolutely fail miserably at it. I'm not going to lie. But it says, He has showed thee, O man, what the Lord requires of you. Seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Those three things, but they are some of the three most difficult things to do sometimes. They just, they really are. But that's exactly what Christ did. He sought the justice of God. He extolled mercy to people. And he walked humbly with God. And he says, if another shall come in his own name. Now, we, we could doubt whether the Lord doesn't intend to say under the assumed name of Messiah uh, in some specifically shaped form. But the man coming is in, is his, in his own name is is false. Uh, there's no commission from God. Uh, he's after his own ambition, uh, not with the works of God. He has uh, deceptions about him, not the glory of the Father, but it's his own. He's not in agreement with the scriptures uh, and, and all of these things. And we're about to get into this here. You know, Matthew 24 and verse 24 says, for false Christs and false prophets will arise that perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, even Christians. There are going to be people that rise up 
people doing great signs, great wonders. We look at Simon the, the zealot, Simon the sorcerer, you know, in the New Testament, who convinced a lot of people, you know, with his illusions and what have you, and drew a lot of people away. Acts 20 and verse 29, Luke records, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among, among you, not sparing the flock. Now, any thoughts or comments before we get into the, this next point? Okay. At this point, when we're talking about people coming in the Father's name versus people coming in their own name, when we're talking about false prophets, false Christs, people coming in among Christians, not sparing the flock, I think it's kind of a good idea to take just a slight detour, just a slight detour to look at the term antichrist. Okay? Um, we see a lot of that now. People saying, you know, the antichrist, he's going to come out of Rome, he's going to gather all nations to himself, and, you know, Kirk Cameron's going to make a movie about it, and, you know, all of this other type of garbage. Uh, because that's what it is. Um, f and for some doctrines, the theology of the Antichrist, it takes some place sometime in the future. Again, single individual uh, person, you know, survives a, a wound to the head, makes peace among all of the nations and all of that. The term Antichrist, though, only occurs four times in Scripture. Only four. And not a one of them in the book of Revelation. Um, let's go ahead and look over here. At, and You can jot these down or we can turn to them. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. That's the first occurrence. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18 says, Children, it is... By the way, these four instances are only recorded by John. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Okay, so there's the first problem. Well, the first two problems. Is, and, and I said that it occurs four times, it's four, five times in four verses is what I meant. Is first, he says... Many antichrists have come. That does not point to anything in the future. It is present tense that John is writing. Antichrists are already there. That's the first issue. It's not someone in the future who's drawing all nations to themselves or anything. They are already there. The second thing is he uses the plural. And he, and he says many antichrists have come. So it's not just one person. There's more than one. The second time is 1 John chapter 2, just a few verses down in verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Now, I'm not going to get into Revelation in this class. Part of the reason being is, one, it's a class on John. Number two is because Revelation is a very complicated book. It really would require its own class, and it's not... We can have that after John, if you like. It is not just a letter, but it's also a letter. It's a prophecy. It's, it's a few different types of books. But he tells us what the definition of an antichrist is. This is the antichrist. One who denies the father and who denies the son. In today's language, we could say that by that definition, by the biblical definition, we could say that an atheist is an antichrist. It's very simple. Antichristos. Christos being Christ. Someone who is antichrist. That simple. 1 John 4 and verse 3 is the next instance. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3. 
third verse, fourth instance, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus, uh, that does not confess Jesus, not from Jesus from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and now is in the world already. You heard that these people were coming. Now, how did you hear that they were coming? Well, first of all, Christ was not yet born. You know, he had not, you know, he had not yet come on earth. They knew that there were going to be people against him. They heard about these people. Christ has come. He's died on the cross. The old law is nailed to the cross. He is risen from the dead. He sits at the right hand of the Father. The Christianity is spread out uh, throughout the region. And there are people who they had heard about previously that would confess or say that Jesus is not from God. That is that type of spirit. The, the spirit of a, someone who is an antichrist is one who says Jesus is not from God, he's not the son of God, and from the, the previous one is, you know, I deny God, I deny Christ. Because remember, we're looking over here in John 5, five and in, in, in the previous uh, chapters, if you accept God, then you'll accept me. If you don't accept me, you're not accepting God. So if the spirit is someone who does not accept Christ, then they are automatically not accepting God, which puts them in that, uh, in that first, first category. And then the last of the four verses is 2 John 1 and verse 7. 2 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if you're taking notes. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, we see the, the deceiver, the antichrist. The thing we have to remember about the Greek language is there are certain words that are not in there. To, for, in, by, with, they have to be inserted in there by the, by the translators. So John, in these four different sections of Scripture, says, look, you've, you've heard about these people. These people are not only here, but this is how you can identify them because they deny Christ, they deny God. Essentially, they would also be denying his work just, just by connection. And they're not just in one area, but they've gone out to the entire world and are spreading this deceit. Right? Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Right. Jew or Gentile would not matter. If you deny Christ, you are Antichrist. Th that simple. It's, yeah, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. Because, yeah, you're absolutely right. There are some people who would go and talk to him privately. For example, Nicodemus. Go talk to him privately, but in public, maybe not so much. And we read of others who, they, at first, uh, they didn't want to lose their station in the synagogue, so they met with disciples and apostles privately. And then later on, they were public about their faith. But, yeah, denial of Christ, public, private, Jew, Gentile, because you have to remember also what Paul wrote as well. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female. All is one in Christ Jesus. And so the opposite of that is all are one out of Christ as well. It's kind of, you're either with them or against them. Yeah. Um, so the, the false, so back in, does anybody have any questions about those verses in, in John, by the way? Correct. Yeah, it's only in these four verses. That's the only place it's found. Uh, 
Right. Revelation. Sure. Well, they do, and they're not, because there's some things that the beast is doing, you know, or that's described as doing, you know, um, in Revelation that that's not. Yeah, it's kind of a special designation, if you will. Right. It, Revelation, and this is one of the reasons why Revelation is, is so difficult. Um, for example, the, the first, uh, let me see here. Okay, the first, for example, the revelation, the word revelation just means revealing, okay? So the revealing of Jesus Christ, right? So it's revelation. This is in chapter 1 of Revelation, so it's uh, a revelation. In verse 3, it's also called the prophecy. Here are the words of the prophecy, he says. So it's part revelation, it's part uh, prophecy. And then I'm looking because I didn't have the verse offhand. Um, but it's also in chapter 1 where it mentions that it's a letter. So a lot of people, they just want to take Revelation and they say, well, Revelation is a book of prophecy. No, it's actually three different types of, of things that are, that are rolled into one. So it's got to be very carefully dissected. Um, just for example, just as an example, and then we'll get back to John 5. Um, you know, people talk about the thousand-year reign of Christ that he's going to come back, he's going to establish his throne on earth at his return, and he's going to reign for a thousand years and, and all of this. Well, the first thing is that would mean that Christ came, would be coming back four times. It is that he came to earth once, the word became flesh. After he dies crucified, he comes back again. Then he goes up, uh, then he goes up to the Father, and then he would come back for this thousand-year reign. And then there's the reign of tribulation, so he goes or whatever, and then he comes back again to take the people with him. So there's four reigns. Also, in that particular section of Revelation, it never talks about Christ stepping foot on the earth again. In fact, earlier verses we have, we will meet him in the air. We will see him coming in the clouds. We will meet him in the air. Not that he's going to sit there and soil himself with earth. And I say soil himself simply because he has been to heaven. He, he, he has been to heaven. He's not going to step foot on this earth again. Right? Um, it was okay after the resurrection and the, the woman were touching him. And he said, you know, be careful. I haven't gone to my father yet. But now he's, he's gone to heaven. Next time he comes back is, is for that. A lot of people misuse a lot of things in Revelation. You know, the Jehovah's Witness, for example, many of them teach, you know, the 144,000 that are to be saved. And yet they conveniently leave out that those 144,000 are all virgin men. So they're, according to that, there's no woman in heaven and no married man and, and everything else. So anyhow, but yeah, and, and, and maybe after John, maybe we can look at, at doing a class on, on Revelation or something because there's a lot that has to do actually with Rome in there and coded language of the time so that other Christians wouldn't be persecuted. So Caesar and his, the Praetorian guards and, and what have you wouldn't find uh, several things out. Good thoughts, So, Any other thoughts or, or comments? Anything about the Antichrist? Anything about Kirk Cameron? Okay. The Nick Cage movie was better, I thought. Anyhow, um, so the false messiah that Christ is speaking of, it, it's not one individual per, per se. It, it's, there are many false messiahs that, that will come. And that have come, according to John. They are already there. You know, had they truly loved God, had these Pharisees truly loved God, they could not have failed to love God's Son. Remember, their chief aim is in studying the Scriptures, in looking into these Old Testament prophecies and oracles and seeing how are they going to be fulfilled? Who is going to be, fulfill them? What is this person going to to maybe look like? Where are they going to come from? And, and yet, they had no idea that he was standing right in front of them. 
On the one, uh, that's on the one hand. On the other side of the coin, though, there are some who will say we shouldn't be too harsh with them, you know, because they didn't have the Bible written as we have with the 66 books. The problem with that statement is they had everything from the Old Testament, and that's what Christ referred to. They had plenty to point to him. There are over 300 prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament, whether it's Christ, his church, his people, his work, over 300 of them. And they did not see a one. That should also tell us something about seek and you will find. It should tell us something about there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. There's a, you know, a lot of people think that the broad way, it's got a, like a sign above it that says hell, and the narrow way has got a little sign above it that says heaven. No, that's not true. They both have a sign that says heaven. But this is kind of a false heaven, if you will, that a lot of people are going to. People who are, they read their Bible, they have a knowledge of the Bible, but they just can't see it. That also points to our responsibility as Christians in an, us being able to teach people and talk to people and evangelize because there are plenty of people that go in that way and what we need to be able to do is, hey, can I take them by the hand and, hey, why don't, you, why don't you come over here? Sorry, I may be walking out of camera, Barry, but, hey, why don't you come over here? You know, and I'll, I'll show you this narrow way. I'll, I'll help you on, on this way. And, you know, there's irony, Jesus said, in their unwillingness of the Jews to accept him. He says, I've come in my Father's name, and you don't accept me. But if someone else comes in your own name, you'll accept him. They were ready to, they were ready to accept imposters. That's the sad thing. They were ready to accept people who were there for popularity or for money because they could relate to that person. They couldn't relate to someone wholly and purely focused on God. All right? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, ultimately. Uh, and I think the biggest time that I see that, um, and, and uh, the, I think the biggest time that I see people putting on this false idea of who God is and making it about themselves is when they say, you know, things like, I don't like the Old Testament God. I don't like that, that kind of, type of wrathful Sodom and Gomorrah, turn this dude's wife into salt God. I, I'm really not about that. I'm more about this one over here, who Jesus, he never talked about this, and he was really kind of mellow, and he was like a first century hippie from Jerusalem, and you know, if, if, he, if he had, then maybe he'd be driving around in one of those little VW vans or something, right? Like in the late 60s. That, that's the Jesus that they want. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, that God, he is the same one. He's, he doesn't have a split personality. He says, I am vengeful. I am wrathful. You need to do what I say. So why can't we get it? It's because, like Israel was saying, we project an image. Instead of opening up the book and seeing this is who God is, we say, no, this is who I want God to be. This is, this is my God. And... And any time you are crafting your own God, it's called idol worship, right? Because you've created a false God for yourself. Did you? Sure. No, absolutely, absolutely. 
And we, and we, even, and we see it in the church a lot too. You know, uh, in the sense of, and I, in preaching, I, I believe that people should have a steady diet in preaching, right? Meaning that we do need to have sermons about love and about peace and about joy and things, but we don't need to have them so much that we neglect sin, that we neglect hell and, and all of these other things. So I think that there, that there should be a, a steady diet. And... God being the same, the, the idea of discipline being the same, you know, because, you know, he never changes. People just don't want to hear it. Majority of people. Blanket statement, I know. <laughs> you know. Um, and so they, they fashion a, a God that they want to hear. And unfortunately, the church suffers, you know. Sure. And, you know, it, it would, yeah, and it would help us as Christians, you know, he is referred to as our Heavenly Father. It would help us if, as Christians if we connected that to our own family relationships. If I did wrong as a kid, should I not expect my dad to punish me? I did wrong. You know, and kids, you know, sometimes, and maybe you've said this, I would sometimes say, I did not ask to be born. I did not ask to be here. That's your fault, okay? And I know that y'all have heard kids say it before or something, right? And it's like, okay, well, I didn't ask to be created either, just like I didn't ask to be born, but my father tells me to do something, and he tells me to do it for my own good. And if I don't do it, then I've disobeyed him. And if I disobey him, he punishes me. Now, why is it that we think it's okay for us to do that, but for God it's not? Why is it that God as our Father isn't allowed to punish us when we do wrong? Why isn't he allowed to tell us what we should and should not do for our own good, right? I think if, I think if people uh, started looking at it that way, then they would probably start to understand God more and why he does those things. Did my dad sit there and tell me probably a couple of times a week to go in the backyard and get a switch? That's a twig for you youngins. <laughs> more than a twig. You know, to get a switch or something like that because he hated me? Now, I didn't understand it as a kid. No, he was doing it to correct me, and it was because he loved me. He wanted the best for me. He wanted me to do right. So why can't God have that? Why, why do we try to rob God of being a, a parent, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's same thing, you know. You're going to, we tell our kids, you're going to grow up, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have to live with that. Same thing as Christians. We're going to make mistakes. And sometimes we're going to have to live with those mistakes because, you know, it's, it's past. Maybe it was, you know, something that was going on with a brother or sister and then they've passed on or something and that can't be reconciled and we have to live with that, whatever the case may be. Any other thoughts or comments, though? Okay. Um, verse 44. Uh, verse 44, he says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? I do not seek the glory that comes from, uh, from the only God. So Jesus, he's angered, but he's not angry that they refuse to glorify him. He's angry because they refuse to glorify God, right? And the desire for human praise, affirmation, and prestige, it's crippled them 
to where they can't love God because they're too busy focusing on themselves. You know, and, you know, you've heard me say in sermons, and I think it might have been this last Sunday, uh, I said something to the effect of, this might sound harsh, but I don't care, right? Um, and I know there might have been some who, who might have even been thinking, wow, Mike doesn't care about me, you know? It's not that. First of all, I care about each of y'all. I love each and every one of y'all. It's not that. Is that sometimes things are going to be harsh. I have to hear them. Y'all have to hear them. Sometimes there are going to be things that we don't like, things that we disagree with. It, it, kind of that tough love type of thing, you know? It's like, I'm telling you this because I love you, right? Uh, the idea, and I've heard, I'm sure you've probably heard the illustration of, you know, you're walking by and you see your neighbor's house on fire. Their car's in the driveway, so you know that they're home. You know, do you, you know, so you run up, you kick in the door, you know, you've got this adrenaline going, you see them sleeping on the couch and you start to grab them and, and they wake up and they just start slapping at you and everything. And they're, oh, just leave me alone, leave me alone. And, and it's kind of, okay, this might be harsh, but I am going to drag you out by your toenail because I don't want you to burn, right? It's kind of the same thing. There are some times, yes, we, we do need to be careful of the way that we say things, but then there are some times when things just have to be bluntly said because there is no other way to say them or because you've tried one way and it hasn't worked another way. There are some people uh, who I, I know, who I have talked to for years and you know tried telling them hey i'll study the bible with you you know we can we can look it's not my opinion it's not yours we, we will just simply look and see what the scriptures say and and all of this and try that for years until finally it gets to a point be like look you are straight up going to hell if you don't open this book and start doing what it says you know so, uh, i didn't stop caring about them it's just a matter of sometimes people hear it, well, some people hear it, are more receptive to it, I guess, this way, and some people aren't, right? But yeah, absolutely, and so they're, they're looking at receiving glory from one another, and they're not seeking glory that comes from God, and so he's human noteworthies, uh, you know, but the son who bears the divine credentials, he's the one that's rejected. You'll take other people that are in it for themselves, but you won't take me. Why? Because I am so unlike you. I, I'm, I'm not in it for, again, money, political office, or anything. And you just can't fathom that. You ever have someone give something to you, and they don't want anything in return? And you sit there and you think to yourself, what do they want? You know, what do they want that they're not saying? Or what are they going to bring up later? We even tell our kids, you know, if something is too good to be true, it probably is. That's kind of, or nothing in life is free, right? Christ, he was all about freely you've received, freely you give. Not in it for me. It is so, his nature is so unlike human nature. And the reason that they were eager to accept the, these people who claimed to be the Messiah who came in their own name, that they were unwilling to receive Christ. It's now made clear. Most people then and now, they're heavily dependent on, on accepting praise. But any, any thoughts or, or comments on that so far? Mm-hmm.
Sure. Right. No, absolutely. No, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's one thing that, that many preachers do when they're reading the Bible, and maybe this will help, is read the Old Testament for your illustration and your New Testament for your application. Because what we're because, you know, Paul, he wrote that the things that are written before him were written for our learning. So a lot of what we're told to apply in the New Testament, someone in the Old Testament has dealt with in some way. So a lot of the times, we, so we see illustration in the Old Testament, application in the New Testament. And so when we're seeing something in the New Testament that we're reading as New Testament Christians, and we struggle, well, how, how do I do this? Or, or how can I deal with this? Or how can I address this? There is, generally speaking, someone or a figure in the Old Testament that has dealt with it on some level uh, to help be able to turn to and look and, you know, how did, you know, Naomi or Ruth or, or anybody in the Old Testament, how did they deal with it, right? Yeah, and there are things we read in the Old Testament and it's like, wow, uh, I can't believe that God ordered them to slaughter, you know, all of these babies, Sounds harsh, but then I have to think, is it better for that baby to left, be left to die in the elements or for wild animals, or is it better for them to be killed and go to God? You know, what, what's, you know so we, we really have to kind of absorb uh, what we're doing. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. We're a minute or two past. Um, I thought we'd get to the end. Uh, so, next Wednesday we will pick up with verse 43. And, no, I'll be here next Wednesday. It's only Sunday that, that I'm missing. Um, hey, we got through two verses today. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait until we have it on Wednesdays and on Sundays. We'll be going through five verses a week. <laughs> um.